I'm Jerry Seib with The Wall Street Journal. We're joined today by David Stockman, former budget director, former congressman, former private equity investor, right. and now author of a book, a big book, called The Great Deformation, The Corruption of Capitalism in America. Thanks for being with us. Glad to be here. Um, in this book, you're offering a forecast of where the American economy is headed. That's dire, I, to say the least. Um, you're essentially predicting a collapse. Why and how? Well, I call it uh, sundown in America, and I have a reason, and that is the machinery of government, I believe, is massively failing in all its branches. The budget is now so out of control, it's a fiscal doomsday machine. The gap is too big. The inability to generate consensus is so great that I think we're just going to add trillions and trillions and trillions. The outlook is far worse than they're telling you. It's not on a glide path down. I believe if you have honest, not unrosy scenario economics, it's on a banana peel uh, heading up. I think the Fed has become a serial bu bubble machine way off the deep end of anything that was ever felt to be reasonable or rational or sound historically. They're in so deep with this balance sheet at 3.2 trillion and expanding at this rate that I don't believe they can get out. All of Wall Street is simply front running what the Fed is doing. Our political parties are broken and failed completely. I think they're basically glorified concierges who introduce politicians to money. That is PACs, K Street, how you get reelected. They stand for nothing. They'll compromise everything. We have had bad policy breaks, breakthroughs, inflection points in recent years that set terrible precedents. The bailouts in 2008, I think, were terrible. They were almost a coup d'etat by Wall Street, not in some sinister sense, but the Treasury was running the thing based on Blackberries that they were looking at by the second. I call it the Blackberry Panic of 2008, and I think most of that was way exaggerated. That would have burned out in the canyons of Wall Street. I do not think there was a Great Depression 2.0 lurking. I do not think the ATMs would have gone dark, and I try to demonstrate this, or payrolls would have been missed in, in all of the legends that came out of that. So now we have a system that believes legends that are only a few years old and that aren't true. We have a system that's run by people who are always thinking it's going to get better tomorrow. There's a denial of the real <clears throat> huge problems we're facing. And this machinery, parties, budget, the, the Fed, is all uh, broken and on a very bad course. That's. Um that's a broad indictment. Yes. But let me let me take you to a specific part of it. You mentioned central banks a couple of times. Is um, is in your view, is the cause of the problem you're describing easy money at its base, at its yeah, root? Yeah, but it's not only easy money, it's massively, drastically, crazily easy money. When you have the funds rate set at zero effectively in late 2008, and they're promising to keep it there through 2015, that's six years of zero percent money. When you have the Fed saying we're going to buy massively in the belly of the curve, carry traders have a you know perfect setup buy the 2%, the 10 year, get a 1.8 yield, immediately repo it, uh, 98 cents on the dollar, pay 10 cents overnight, keep rolling it, collect the spread, laugh all the way to the bank and sleep like a baby because Uncle Ben has basically said the funds rate is staying at zero and I'm in there as a massive bid to keep all the risk assets and even the treasury bond uh, price up. So when you know you can do that, you're going to get massive carry trade speculation. That's the only thing that's happening. Uh, you uh, are inflating for the third time you know, in this century, the same bubble. We're back to where we were, interestingly, 4,750 days ago. The S&P 500 is, was where it is today. Okay. But do you think there was not a liquidity crisis in 2008 and 2009? No, there was a bubble that developed massively with too much false, unsustainable, destructive liquidity under the Greenspan Bernanke policy of 1% interest rates from 202 to 207. And then once you got everyone speculating like crazy and you had the Wall Street balance sheets, top 10, I go through it top 10 banks, investment and the big universal banks, their balance sheets from long-term capital was 3.5 tr uh, tr uh, trillion at that date. Eight years later was 11.5 trillion. Massive, okay. Eight trillion worth of balance sheet expansion on a couple hundred billion dollars worth of equity. All the rest of it was funded. 
essentially leverage much of it wholesale money, hot money that was raised not from depositors who were going to stick, but from uh, you know overnight money, uh, unsecured commercial paper, repo, and so forth. So that set up a massive accident waiting to happen, and the only thing that was going on is the uh, Mr. Market was finally bringing about his wrathful cleansing that needed to happen so that these pyramids of leverage on leverage would be liquidated. It would have stayed in the canyons of Wall Street. And you would have let the market forces work their will at that point? We needed to. We needed to have a generational uh, lesson. See, I would say Goldman should have gone down, and it would have because Morgan Stanley was going down, and Blankfein uh, called up Paulson. Paulson admits it, for crying out loud, in his memoirs, that uh, he was told by John Mack, or he was told by uh, Blankfein, you've got to save Morgan Stanley because if you don't, they're going to come after us now. Next. Now, I want to say that Goldman Which Sachs... Which was probably true at that time, right? It could be, and they should have gone down because they were vulnerable. And Goldman Sachs then would have spawned. There's a lot of talent there. Twelve new firms. Three guys would have formed an M&A firm. Four other guys would have formed a credit trading firm. But the one thing would be different is they would have all lost $100 million worth of stock, and the new firms they organized would not have been engaged in the same speculative, reckless activity that, frankly, they're doing once again today. You, um, you would never have moved off the gold standard. You make that clear. Do you seriously think moving back to the gold standard would fix some of these problems now? I think what we need to do is move back to a Federal Reserve that is similar to what Carter Glass established in 1914. We know him from Glass-Steagall. Really, he was a brilliant founder of the Fed, one of the greatest students of monetary and financial matters ever to serve in elective office. And his idea was a banker's bank. In other words, the Fed could not buy government bonds. There was no open market. There was no interest rate manipulation. It was only a discount window where banks could come with good collateral at a penalty rate of interest, floating free market interest rates, and liquefy trade receivables or inventories in order to pay depositors. That is not central planning. That is the private market generating its own liquidity. What we have now is the Milton Friedman model, okay? Sever, uh, you know, uh, the system from any anchor in terms of a hard asset and let 12 guys on the open market committee become the Politburo to run the economy. Now, of course, Milton Friedman said that they have to be very stingy, 3%, never do more, never do less. But he was naive politically and did not realize that sooner or later you get a Greenspan, you get a Bernanke, people that either had great ideologies or power drives, and they would soon be rationalizing doing what Bernanke did, which was creating 700 million of new balance sheet, which is new money, an hour in September and October uh, 208. You that know, is off the charts. Let, let's, let's turn to the fiscal side for one second. So you say that the Republican Party lost its sense of fiscal rectitude in the Reagan era. You were the Reagan budget director, not briefly, but for four and a half years. Right. Did you? eliminate fiscal rectitude in the Reagan part in the yeah, Republican Party? Yeah, I would say, and that's why I wrote a book right after I left saying, the fa you know, my book was called The Triumph of, uh, of politics. Uh, politics, The Failure of the Reagan Revolution. And basically there was a plausible plan in 1980 that was never put to numbers that said we're going to build up defense, big cut back in domestic spending, and uh, individual tax rate cuts. What happened in the real world of to and fro of policy and politics is the defense budget soared mm -hmm. and Reagan was unwilling to even look at it as big government and stop it and it was terrible and I've got a you know whole analysis of that. Uh, the tax cut got into a bidding war that a lot of people don't remember, but in the summer of 1981, the Democrats were giving away more revenue than we were. So you got an oil depletion allowance, we'll do something for the savers, and the thing just got out of hand. The tax cut doubled in size, and then we couldn't cut spending even by a third of what was needed or we thought. So by the fall of 1981, I realized the thing had come apart at the seams. We needed a drastic mid-course correction. We did a little bit of it. Reagan did it reluctantly. He raised taxes mm -hmm. in 82, 83, and 84. Half of the tax cut was taken back. But we never could get spending cuts. We never could slow down the defense uh, war machine. And as a result of that, Reagan plus Bush, who was really just his you know, nominee successor, in 12 years tripled the national debt from $1 trillion 
to uh, over almost four trillion. And the Republican politicians' takeaway from that was, well, maybe deficits don't matter after right. all, thereby repudiating the fundamental tradition, conservative tradition of Republicans, the Eisenhower balanced budget fiscal rectitude position of Republicans. And then today, after 20 or 30 years, you have a whole generation of Republicans who basically, uh, you know, uh, wave their arms at the deficit, but really don't think it matters. L last question, a lot of ground to cover here, but one last question. So some of the uh, prescriptions that you offer for fixing the problem, yes. at least on the political side here, things like six-year term limits, single limits for president uh, and for members of Congress, uh, short uh, uh, elections, election yeah. seasons, uh, public financing of campaigns. A lot of people would say those were essentially undemocratic proposals. Are you saying that dem democracy can't handle the complexity of this, uh, of this fiscal problem that we've created for ourselves? Yes, I'm saying we have to abolish incumbency. That's what that uh, amounts to. You can run for office, be a citizen legislator, spend six years never running for election, never raising a dime, never going to a fundraiser, giving, not giving a hoot about PACs in K Street, and whatever your viewpoint is, left, right, or center, go after policy change and then go back to life and you know be a shoe salesman or whatever you were before. Now, you might say that's extreme. It takes a constitutional amendment, I agree. Public finance only, not one dime of private money, not PAC, nothing else. Eight-week election, every two years, so a third of the system gets reelected. But I say it's the only way that we can rescue the democratic machinery from the massive barnacles of crony capitalism, uh, PACs, and money-dominated finance. Otherwise, it will never change. Every program in the budget is a jobs program. Every uh, loophole in the tax code is a jobs program. It's got huge lobbies behind it. And you see what happens. We just drift, kick the can, and the problem gets bigger. So I think you would need radical surgery. Do I think it's possible? No. I mean, who's going to pass this constitutional that was, amendment? That I was but, the ask, only, but, <laughs> but the only reason I bring it up is yeah. to basically uh, establish a standard to show how far yeah. we are from this, and therefore why when I say sundown America, I'm not trying to be some Jeremiah. I'm trying to say, hey, let's, let's be honest around here. This machinery is broke. And it's running towards a wall at, at a very uh, dangerous rate. Well, David Stockman, you've made waves <laughs> at a minimum. Uh, thanks for making some more with us today. Appreciate your joining us. Great. I'm Jerry Seib with The Wall Street Journal.